Welcome everyone. So grateful to have you all here and with us. I wish I could be with you in person, but I am recovering from surgery and not able to travel at this point. So I'm with you all in spirit and so grateful for each and every one of you and really so grateful for each and one and every one of our members, um, especially those that go above and beyond to serve on committees, to share their vision and their passion and their creativity um, with each other, with me, with um, our community at large, as we do the necessary and important work of protecting the most vulnerable and working for safer social work practice for ourselves, but especially for the most vulnerable and marginalized and oppressed amongst us, the ones who are um, being supported by our members every day. And I learned so much from each of you, and I am so deeply inspired and grateful for each and every one of you and everything that you do and the ways that you teach me, the ways you teach the people around you. This is such an exciting event to celebrate each of you, um, to celebrate our profession, because the work that we do is so countercultural and so important. We travel in between all of the different silos of our world and we build bridges and we advocate and we make connections between one and the other. And that's what it means to be a social worker. Um, it's not an easy job, but it's the most important job. When someone comes in and it's complicated and hard to navigate, they call us and that's what we do. And it's often not celebrated the way it should be because it's so countercultural. And so that's why tonight is so important. We need to nourish ourselves with joy because our world is not always very joyful. Um, but what we're doing matters and is changing lives and is changing systems. And so that joy really matters. And tonight it's about joy and celebration, about gratitude, about inspiration, and about trying comfort and encouragement from one another in knowing that even when we think that what we're doing is alone because we're just one social worker in the middle of nowhere and no one's around and does what we do matter. And those are the kinds of questions that colonization teaches us. Yes, what we're doing matters. And this is part of how we disrupt colonial systems. So this dinner tonight is a celebration and you are worth celebrating. We, our profession is worth celebrating. And we don't get to celebrate it enough, just like we don't get to have moments for gratitude enough. And we don't get to have moments for nourishing our hearts and spirits. We also don't have many opportunities to celebrate where we are and root ourselves in the land where we are and reconnect to this planet. And that's one of the reasons why I'm so grateful for the land acknowledgements that um, we do. And so I'm very honored to be able to offer this land acknowledgement. And as I prepare to, I invite you to take a few moments to close your eyes and, and think about a favorite spot on this beautiful unseated Mi'kma'ki, a favorite spot of yours. It could be the ocean, it could be the forest, it could be a mountain, it could be a park, it could be your backyard, it, wherever it is. Take a moment, close your eyes and connect to it as I prepare to do this land acknowledgement. And I, I wanna say before I even do it, my gratitude to all of our Mi'kmaq and indigenous social workers who have guided me who have guided us in creating this ever evolving acknowledgement. As we do it, we continue to learn and unlearn and revise because the words we're using are not always perfect. They are English words and English is the language of those who colonized this land. So therefore it is imperfect. And if you have not looked at our Decolonizing Social Work Connections magazine, I invite you to do it. Um, there's a whole article with a lot of the awesome um, people who helped create this land acknowledgement. Crystal is one of them and is hopefully sitting with you all tonight celebrating um, our profession and our members. So I wanna just also give gratitude for them for helping me to even begin to find the words to offer this land acknowledgement because that it's it all begins with gratitude, right? So hopefully you are connecting in your mind with a vision or a memory or a hope or a prayer for our earth, for our land, this land where we get to be. And I want to begin by acknowledging that I am speaking from Unamagi, which is located on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq, whose inherent rights were recognized in the peace and friendship treaties that were signed with the Mi'kmaq, Maliseet, and Passamaquoddy peoples from 1725 to 1779. This series of treaties did not surrender Indigenous land, resources, or sovereignty to the British Empire, but instead established rules for an ongoing relationship between nations. The treaties were later reaffirmed by Canada in Section 35 of the Constitution Act, 
1982, and they remain active to this day. Let us take this time to pause in reflection and gratitude for the land where we live and work. The Nova Scotia College of Social Workers commits to translating this acknowledgement into action by seeking to implement the recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action, especially those regarding education. We commit to doing what we can to becoming better treaty partners. We commit to learning and to unlearning. Let us take this moment to pause in gratitude for all who have and continue to heroically care and advocate for this beautiful land. May we join them in the sacred work. Let us ground ourselves in the wisdom of the land-based Mi'kmaq teachings and values that we must all begin to learn. Let us work to decolonize ourselves, our practice, and this community that we share by working for justice for all living beings as an expression of our gratitude for being here. Let us take a deep breath and recenter ourselves away from the violent ways colonization fills our world and fills us. Let us take a deep breath and work on letting go of the unconscious bias that is everywhere, inside and out. And may tonight's celebration lead us to continue to work to being in right relationship with this land and with one another. And when we acknowledge the land, we have to also acknowledge the wisdom of this planet and align ourselves with its truths. And this tree stump and human fingerprint that I love to show, I think it's a powerful visual. It shows not only how interconnected we are with nature, and it shows not only how similar we are, but it also has this truth of these spiral circles, these webs of connection, where perhaps we are working with people with our ecological systems theory perspective, where we understand that there is the micro, mezzo, and macro. And that's how social work has often looked at things, right? But it's not just the micro, mezzo, macro, but we actually have to decolonize social work to ground ourselves in the land-based teachings where we are and in the larger ecological context where we are. And then to recognize how that informs who we are on the inside and all of the different levels of systems from body, mind, heart, and spirit, and all of the different aspects of who we are intergenerationally, culturally, spiritually, all of those different components, and intersectionally, how those are created externally, but absorbed internally, and then who we are connected to and our webs of connection. And that's really the grounding of our advocacy work, the ways in which, because we are all positioned in intersectional ways across our communities, we can impact so many more people than we think when we just have a colonial mindset of it's just me alone in this room. It's not just us alone in this room ever. And so tonight is about reminding ourselves about who we are and how we transform people's lives often without realizing it and how that goes in powerful ways to disrupt the current systems, to create meaning and purpose and healing and hope and justice and equity and restorative practices and working towards truth and reconciliation. This is how we are going to continue to make this world that we live in, this life that we live, align with the land-based values of this unceded territory where we are in this planet that desperately needs our healing wisdom. And the way we do it, us who too often are burnt out with vicarious trauma and knowing that we are working in systems that cause harm and we have this moral distress, the way we heal is by taking time for ourselves to nourish ourselves and to celebrate one another because that little light that we shine it can illuminate much broader just like one candle can illuminate a lot of darkness and tonight we have many candles that are gathered and i am speaking to you after having had a uh, opportunity for a day-long retreat with all of our committee members who hopefully are feeling celebrated today as well and all of them are working to dream and envision how can we move forward in our commitment to truth and reconciliation, in our commitment to aligning to our new code of values and ethics that says that we have to move from neutral but working for social justice to advocating for anti-racist practice, anti-biased practice, working towards the kind of world that is at the core of what drew us to social work. And that is how we root ourselves. When we root ourselves in what drew us into this profession, then we can't be burned out because we are being nourished from a fire deep within that is grounded in something so much deeper. Tonight, we're going to celebrate what drew us into social work, what keeps us going, and who are the people who inspire us, who advocate with us, who help us to do better and be better. My abiding gratitude to each of you.
pull out here. Hi there, my name is Ali Farmer and I nominated Kaylee for the Frida Vickery Award. I'm the employment coordinator at the Elizabeth Fry Society of Mainland Nova Scotia, and I have worked here since September of 2022. I have been so fortunate to have Kaylee as my role model while navigating my role at the Abundance Program. The Abundance Program has a thrift store called the Abundance Store, and that has allowed many women and gender diverse individuals to work on their wellness, employment, and build confidence while navigating uh, employment. While managing the team, Kaylee has shown her employees and the community why this program is so important and empowering. Kaylee has taught her students, coworkers, clients, and myself to strive for opportunities and work towards our goals daily while supporting those around us. Through the Abundance Program, Kaylee has instilled the importance of community and making a positive change to address the gaps in the community. Kaylee said something to me that has fueled my passion for this project, and that is to reach for the stars, meaning to use your creativity to make a positive change for ourselves and for those around us. I'm incredibly proud to be able to work with Kaylee daily and share my passion for this project and others. Thank you. Hi there. My name is Kaylee Smith, and I am the Abundance Program Manager with the Elizabeth Fry Society of Mainland Nova Scotia. The Elizabeth Fry Society is a nonprofit organization that works with criminalized women, girls, and gender diverse individuals along their reintegration and recovery journeys. My role with the organization began about five years ago as overnight support staff at our transition home. And then I myself transitioned pretty quickly into program facilitation as the Abundance Program Coordinator. The Abundance Program is a reintegrative program that recognizes the importance of attainable wellness in fostering positive recovery, reintegration, community, self-sustainability, and independence. For the past five years, I have worked closely with those I serve and other support services in the community to develop and facilitate hands-on programming that encourages self-discovery and teaches participants about ways to maintain and obtain wellness in their lives. Through initiatives like our food security program, our entrepreneurial events like our annual craft fair, and our community engagement programs like our walking group, we have been able to provide women with the opportunity to try new things, enhance or even develop new life skills, and become reacquainted with their communities. As the name suggests, the Abundance Program offers an abundance of things, as we recognize the importance wellness has in all its forms when facing adversity and navigating positive reintegration. So our program specializes in supporting participants in navigating the barriers that they face when pursuing employment and education goals. One project within this realm that I am quite proud of and have worked fairly hard to establish is our Abundance Store. The Abundance Store is a physical thrift store located in the Dartmouth community that we opened about a year ago that offers paid employment and skill development opportunities to criminalize women and gender diverse folks. It also provides the space for our clients who may not be ready for employment to hone their creative skills and sell their artwork to the community. What is special about this project is that it was completely inspired by the unmet needs identified by those I serve. The folks I work with have experienced some of the most horrific traumas and adversities, which have really impacted their opportunities to participate in the workforce. Many of those we work with have never held employment, are unable to maintain employment, or are no longer able to work in their desired field due to a criminal record. To date, this project has provided approximately 20 to 25 unique individuals with paid job placements and the hands-on opportunity to learn and enhance skills in areas of communication, customer service, leadership, teamwork, conflict resolution, time management, budgeting, all of all, all, all sorts of skills. What inspires me to do this work is the power of opportunity and community. It is absolutely incredible to see what can happen when we provide folks with the means to thrive, be well, and succeed. It's also pretty incredible to watch what a sense of community can have in fostering all of those things. In my role, I often meet women at low points in their lives. And through this project, I have been able to witness incredible growth, growth in confidence, empowerment in, in their relationships with each other, their families, and in, in their community. 
One of my favorite things to do is watch participants apply what they are learning and engage so passionately with the public and even when mentoring each other. It's so rewarding to sit and see the women engage passionately with the public and our customers and articulate so beautifully the impact and importance of this project um, and what it has meant to them and those in their community. So with that, I have been fortunate enough to watch women transition from our program to more permanent employment while thriving in their personal and professional lives. As a social worker, it is my passion to contribute to meaningful change by envisioning obstacles as opportunities. And so it's an absolute honor to be named this year's recipient of the Frida Vickery Award. Thank you. I'd like to begin by thanking the Nova Scotia College of Social Workers for offering awards to recognize dedication to the field. So I'm a psychologist. Um, uh, some of my colleagues flatter me by saying I have the heart of a social worker. Um, and like you, I'm very aware of the work of mental health, uh, the very aware of the work of mental health and well-being and supporting families and communities and how it can be very rewarding and also very emotionally demanding and disheartening. This work requires dedication, commitment, and compassion. And I thank the college for continuing to prize these in a socio-political climate that can be polarizing and unsympathetic to individual and cultural difference. I understand that David William Connor's legacy was one of respect, caring, empathy, and dignity towards others, especially youth. I can't think of a more worthy recipient of an honor, of an award in Mr. Connor's honor than Julian Davis. Mr. Davis has a long history of providing support for and advocating for Nova Scotia's LGBT youth. Prior to becoming a social worker, he was a support services coordinator at the Youth Project, a board member with the Nova Scotia Rainbow Action Project, worked with Langhouse, and was well known in the sexual and gender minority communities for his advocacy on behalf of both individual service users and the LGBT community more broadly. Mr. Davis's history as a social worker with Nova Scotia Health is rich with examples of his dedication to frontline work and supporting the dignity of individual clients, clinicians working to improve their own skills and capacity to provide compassionate, client-centered, and evidence-based care, and educating healthcare providers and leaders. He led the development and implementation of a full model DBT program for adolescents and provided ongoing leadership and support to the clinicians on that team. As a clinical practice leader, and now as an advanced practice leader, uh, leader, his work involve, involves supporting specific mental health and addictions program initiatives around providing DBT, good psychiatric management, and evidence-based care more generally. And while he's supported in providing staff with training regarding gender-affirming care, he doesn't have protected time to do so. The result is that Mr. Davis does much of this work on his own time, and this is, of course, on top of his personal life and advocacy roles outside of Nova Scotia Health. He's provided countless trainings on what it means to provide gender-affirming care to clinicians and healthcare providers within and outside of the Mental Health Injection Program. Last year, he provided a webinar introducing the WPATH Standards of Care, version 8, which was attended not only by over 100 mental health and addictions program clinicians, but also by WPATH trainers external to NSH and from as far away as Montreal um, themselves. And this past spring, Mr. Davis was invited speaker at a convention hosted by the Nova Scotia Barrister Society. However, before I sum up, I'd, like to, I'd love to include the perspectives of his teammates. So I'm going to hand that over things over to Marae. Hi, Julian. I'm so grateful that I get to work with you. I admire your courage and openness, and I see it every time we work together. You do such amazing work in the orientation of new staff with me. Uh, you make it easy for us all to ask questions, to learn, and to admit that we don't know everything. The way that you advocate for clients and always lead with your values of kindness, fairness, social justice, integrity, diversity, and inclusion is really inspiring to me. So thank you for everything that you bring to our team, to our clients and their families, and for just being you. <laughs> you so deserve this award, uh, and I want to congratulate you. Hi, Julian. 
Uh, we've only worked together a brief time thus far, but from the first time we met and had an opportunity to sit down and really chat together, it's been abundantly clear that you're a tremendous asset to our team and the community that we serve. So I look forward to continued work with you. Always look forward to any time you and I get a chance to chat. I want to say thank you for all that you do for our community. Hi, Julian. I just wanted to say and tell everyone that Julian has a, a mix of top-notch clinical skills, a willingness to be vulnerable, and, and show such compassion. And that makes a difference to both the clients that he works with and the clinicians who take his courses. I feel so lucky to work with him. Thank you, Julian, for being a fantastic colleague. You make a difference every day. Congratulations, Julian. Um, Julian is an open book and his willingness to be vulnerable um, inspires um, people on our team and in the world around him to ask questions and to speak up about their opinions or ideas and to live honestly. Julian, it's truly an honor to call you a colleague and a friend. Your ability to support the individual and families while gently and effectively pushing for change, not only at the individual and family level, but also within our system and the community is truly honorable. You are my go-to for consult. Your ability to validate each person's worth is commendable and something I strive for. Um, thank you for all that you've done to, to support my own practice um, and for the profession. Oh, what makes Mr. Davis so effective as a clinician, a trainer, and now a leader? So I'm in the fortunate position of receiving Mr. Davis's trainer evaluations and accolades firsthand. And what I repeatedly hear is how by bringing his own experience and vulnerability into the classroom, he creates a context in which learners can be vulnerable themselves, can explore their privileges and biases, and can find an openness and willingness to explore new ideas. Mr. Davis is an out trans man. He is out and repeatedly comes out as trans in a very traditional healthcare system. This is no small feat. The courage he brings to his interactions with groups of people who may act in unpredictable and hostile ways, and indeed this has happened recently in professional forums, is beyond inspiring. His disclosures routinely bring groups to tears of empathy and compassion. He makes it safe for people who are less open to question their own viewpoints. And as we know, that can create great change. He calls to mind the greats in civil rights. And indeed, as cliche as it sounds, he brings out the best of in us. Mr. Davis's actions, both prior to becoming a social worker on the front lines of the profession with individual clients, in his case, youth and their families, in his personal advocacy work and in his training, supervision, consultation, and now leadership, epitomize the values espoused by the Dave and William Connors Memorial Award. He routinely goes well beyond the call of his professional duties. Compassion, dignity, respect, self-definition, and autonomy characterize his trainings and leadership work. And finally, his work is defined by a dedication to making the world better for young people who face the hardships of growing up in a society characterized by macro, meso, and microaggressions against their very identities. I cannot think of anyone who better personifies the qualities of the David William Connors Memorial Award. Congratulations, Julian. I'm so honored to receive the David Williams Connors Memorial Award. As we know, the ability to bring about change occurs not just because of one person though, but rather because of the relationships that build and support such possibilities. And while I wish I could acknowledge everyone who I've learned from and worked alongside, I do wanna highlight a few here, including my amazing team, Nova Scotia Health's Mental Health and Addictions Provincial Center for Training, Education and Learning for this nomination. PCTEL exemplifies how a group of people can bring out the absolute best in each other. With Jackie Cohen at the helm as my manager who shares a similar passion and commitment to 2SLGBTQIA plus affirming care and who exemplifies what it means to be a reflective leader. To Julie McDonald and Emily Lane and the rest of my team who are so brilliant and also incredibly validating coworkers who go above and beyond for each other, clinicians we work with and with for our clients. I also think of my phenomenal colleagues from my prior child and adolescent mental health team in the Annapolis Valley. 
thinking of my fellow DBT clinicians in particular, Daisy Coleman, Kristen Anderson, Susan Proudfoot, and Jen Wielden. So we started up our first local DBT program for youth who struggle significantly with emotional dysregulation. It has been such a privilege to work with you all to develop and see firsthand the life-changing impact DBT has had. You are all exceptional social workers that I'm honored to know and have learned so much from. Much gratitude also to Dana Pulsifer for taking the initial leap of hiring me as a new social worker. I knew I had to come out as trans in my job interview for my own well-being and safety. And she made sure I knew that she had my back and that my work and interest in providing mental health services to trans youth was gonna be fully supported in this rural setting. And I wouldn't have had the impetus to go into social work without the foundational experience I had working at the Youth Project with Leanne Wichman. I channel her frequently when thinking about how to work with people who have, had very, who have different, very different experiences and perspectives and how to find places to align and how to change can happen even within large systems by continually building relationships and always keeping the youth at the forefront of everything we do. And that fun needs to be woven into what can be a hard job some days. I miss her beyond measure. and Her memory continues to fuel my life's work. My work at the Youth Project also brought another life-changing mentor into my world, Nancy Wright, who became my MSW placement supervisor and then candidacy mentor. I hear Nancy's voice often as I work with parents who are struggling to accept their kids as trans or gender diverse, as she modeled an absolute commitment to finding how to leverage parents' love for their child into behaviors that would exhibit it, validating that changing names and pronouns is really hard and they can do it because of how much love they have for their kid. I also miss her tremendously and try to channel her patience, her ability to find a reason to have a little chuckle and the power of a warm smile. I also feel tremendously privileged to have been able to have my worldview shaped by my profs in both the Mount St. Vincent Gender Studies Program and Dallas School of Social Work and through my work at the Pictou County Women's Center with Bernadette McDonald. The power of critical thinking and the education that I received are the exact tools that have equipped me and others to navigate the untruths, and harmful myths and misinformation that we've seen and continue to see affecting so many today. On a personal note, I'm so grateful to have been raised within a family with strong values of social justice and service as an essential part of being a member of a community. My family lives these values in so many ways with my parents, Fred and Debbie, modeling the difference that supportive caregivers can make in the lives of 2SLGBTQIS people. But it's not always easy for caregivers either, and yet putting love at the center is the essence of it all. I also consider myself so lucky to have longtime social worker Steve Borneman as my father-in-law, and have friends also working towards social justice, Nolan Pike, Marshall Haywood, Lou Shepard, Marianne Colburn, Amy Sokolowskis, and others who keep me motivated just by trying to keep up with them, and who also challenge me in vital ways that only dear friends can do. To my partner, Sandra, I also wanna send all my love and gratitude. She saw me before I had the words to describe myself and is the steadfast rock in my life and co-conspirator in ensuring that 2S LGBTQIA plus youth are valued and have adults in their lives that they can see as possibilities for their own futures. To my kids, Micah and Gabe, who are my literal dreams come true and my ongoing inspiration to continue to do my part as they remind me daily that while the problems are complex, the solutions can be quite simple as long as we place love and respect above all else. Thank you again to Jackie and my PCTEL team for this nomination. I am honored beyond words and know that I consider it an immense gift to be able to work alongside all of you. To the Nova Scotia College Social Work for your continued advocacy and work towards social justice, which is truly the work of hope and love. And above all else, want to thank the youth and families who have trusted me to join them during such important times in their lives. And to the 2S LGBTQIA plus youth in particular, know that we are shoulder to shoulder with you as we once again speak out and let those who want to silence us know that's not going to happen as our voices are too strong and the love we have for ourselves and for others will overpower their hate. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Christian Anderson. I'm a proud social worker who lives, learns, and plays uh, in Kwesawatik or Falmouth, Nova Scotia. 
um, and I'm also a previous Robert Stratford uh, Memorial winner. Uh, and I, along with my phenomenal, probably one of the hardest working social workers I've ever met, uh, colleague Shannon Vincent, were overjoyed uh, to hear that our nomination for this year's uh, Robert Stratford Memorial Award winner um, went to our very own Kim Whitman Mansfield. From the moment I met Kim, I knew she was a doer. Uh, she arrives at all of our regional advisory committees uh, across Southwest Nova Scotia. She is the current youth director of the YMCA of Southwest Nova Scotia, a dreamer, uh, a doer, a phenomenal collaborator. Um, she, uh, Shannon and I decided to nominate Kim for this award after working closely with Kim to address a gap in two of our uh, rural areas of the province. Um, so one in, in the creation uh, of a safe space uh, for youth uh, in an area where youth didn't have a lot of uh, opportunity. Uh, and Kim said, yep. Yeah, I can do it, we can make this happen, we can expand, uh, and was a part of that process every step of the way. The second uh, was supporting uh, the application of a, of a pretty large grant uh, in a pretty rural area, and since then has been supporting the creation of community champions uh, to be able to change uh, youth experience uh, in that rural community. Uh, Kim uh, has a, a, a way of always looking to improve services for youth, uh, a focus on equity, diversity, uh, inclusion, and accessibility. And she's actually a marine biologist by training. Uh, since nominating her for this award, uh, we heard how Kim actually took um, a leadership role uh, and, and, and and put in an application with the government of Nova Scotia uh, to be able to offer youth integrated services um, on uh, out of the Bridgewater area. It was a lot of work. I heard it was almost a phone book by the time she submitted it. Again, um, I could not be prouder. Kim, thank you for all of the work you do across community. I hope every time you see this award um, in your office, you display it with pride and think of all of the youth, families, and communities you have positively impact. It's a pleasure to work with you. I am so excited for you that you'll be recognized in this way. Thank you. Hi, my name's uh, Kim Whitman Mansfield. I'm youth director for the YMCA of Southwest Nova Scotia on the South Shore. Um, working with youth um, was probably not an original calling in my life. I, I actually attended Katy University and graduated in 1984 with a degree in uh, uh, Bachelor of Science with a specialty in microbiology. So my first calling, I guess, was to work in the world of science. Um, I worked with fisheries and oceans for a few years and uh, with the fish health uh, unit there uh, and then went to 1987 to the Atlantic Veterinary College when that opened to help create the aquatic microbiology um, center there, uh, the very first uh, fish health lab, diagnostic lab in a veterinary college and created a veterinary curriculum for uh, students to learn about fish because fish was just another animal. So that was my original calling, which is kind of odd considering what I do now, but uh, uh, it, it was a passion I had at that time, but I always found myself drawn to organizations and communities, uh, groups that work with youth and volunteered a lot with a lot of different youth uh, led organizations when I lived in Prince Edward Island. Uh, and so that kind of became a second calling, I guess. Um, and around 2002, um, I decided I had accomplished all I could in the world of aquatic uh, medicine um, and left Prince Edward Island to write a textbook and uh, uh, on bacteria, which again had nothing to do with youth, but uh, it gave me something to, to, to a purpose. Um, and I had a few different jobs working in, uh, in uh, medical device companies and continued in the science realm for a few years because uh, you don't make a lot of money off textbooks. But again, always drawn to um, youth organizations and, and opportunities to volunteer and work with young people. 
risk. Um, and then I had an, a chance to work with a, a medical device company in the town of Bridgewater, which is what led me to come to this area. Uh, and I moved here and uh, worked for a couple of years and again found myself noticing that there wasn't a lot for youth uh, in our community uh, of Bridgewater and the surrounding communities uh, outside of there and felt the need to help create some things and opportunities for, for youth to participate in that were barrier free. And it probably was a result of I had two stepdaughters who uh, encountered, encountered a lot of barriers when they wanted to participate in programming. So it kind of became a calling and then a passion and then it overtook me. Uh, so I gave up my career in, in the world of science and followed my passion, which was working for youth. That led me to the YMCA, uh, Southwest Nova Scotia, which at that time was happy to start uh, a small little youth program on a Friday night. Um, and uh, I got to be part of that and to help launch that and to help create a program that was free for kids to drop into on a Friday night in the town of Bridgewater and anyone from the surrounding communities that could come to it. Um, I was told we would never get the older kids, but I was, uh, I really, really wanted to try to capture that 12 to 18 year old group. So we offered the program to five to 18 year olds. Um, it was slow to start, but we did it. Um, and then about a year into the program, we had 140 youth come to a Friday night program and 75 of them were 12 to 18 year olds. So I knew, I knew there was something there about offering programs that had uh, offered uh, the core values of respect and responsibility and honesty and caring, and most importantly, inclusiveness. So that was my start. And that's the, I found my calling and I found my passion was was just fired at that time. So I continue to work with the YMCA. And to this day, I'm still with the YMCA. That's the longest I've been anywhere. Um, I'm still passionate about offering opportunities for youth. Um, it's very obvious that youth have very few opportunity had very few opportunities in this community um, that weren't uh, fraught with barriers. So it's all about removing those barriers. So making them free, making them accessible and going out into the community where the kids are instead of trying to have them always come to you. So since that start in 2009 with our very first Friday night program, We've continued to work with community members, with organizations, uh, like-minded youth uh, groups, uh, individuals, uh, governments, uh, to offer free, barrier-free programming for youth. Um, we have three youth centers now, two in the town of Bridgewater. We've increased our age to up to including age 24. Uh, we just opened a youth center in uh, Liverpool, uh, and that's been explosive for the number of youth that have participated in that programming. Uh, we work with the schools and offer programming within the schools that they need assistance with, sort of the, the uh, things of the, of the day. So races, anti-racism programs, healthy relationships, friendships, uh, uh, peer violence, um, sexual health, um, consent, those kind of programmings into the, in the schools to help them. Uh, we work closely with a number of the, uh, the school organizations as well to, to partner on a variety of programs. Um, we offer lots of workshops and life skill programs for youth, all of which is free. Uh, all of our programs are funded through grants. We're 100% we are self-sustaining. Uh, we charge no membership fee for any of our programs for youth. Um, and that would just be a barrier. So um, ensuring that youth have access, that the programs are barrier free, um, that we get out to where the youth are and don't expect the youth to always come to us. Um, those are the kind of the important things, all of it built with our core values, ensuring that all youth are respected, all youth feel, have, feel they have a say and, and can take some responsibility for their programming. All of them are cared for, um, that we make sure our programming is inclusive uh, and most importantly, that it's fun. Um, so it, there's something about empowering youth to feel like they matter, that their voice is heard, um, that what they have to say is, is important, um, is really what we're trying to do. Um, youth, youth can control 100% of how they react to their choices, but they need to have those choices. So our goal is to give them as many opportunities as we can 
and empower them to feel good about the choices they make. Whether it turns out to be a positive one or a negative one, they can accept 100% of what that uh, choice that they've made. And that helps them to grow, find acceptance within themselves, and most importantly, outside of themselves. So that's what our goal has been. I've been very lucky to have some great staff to help me with that. And in fact, over half of our staff were one time youth leaders that participated in our programming and helped us create these youth centers where uh, youth have a chance to come and flourish and, and feel valued. So yeah, that's who I am. That's what I do. And that's why I do it. Hello everyone, my name is Kat and I have nominated tonight's ever deserving recipient of the Diane Kayes Memorial Award, Christina Fifield. Before I can share with you a few of the many reasons Christina deserves this award, I would like to thank Suzanne for coordinating the special evening and the Nova Scotia College of Social Workers for inviting me to share a piece of Christina's story with you all here tonight. While skimming the NSCSW newsletter last summer, I noticed the request for nominations for various awards honoring distinguished and exceptional practice in the field of social work. The Diane Kayes Memorial Award is awarded to social workers who demonstrate exceptional professional ethics in the field, a passion for working with and for those experiencing gender-based violence and exceptional social justice advocacy through standing with those most marginalized in our communities. As I was reading the criteria for this award, there was no one who came to mind more, who more perfectly fit these criteria than Christina. As a newly graduated social worker, I began my career working in a transition house for women and children fleeing domestic violence. It was here that I first met Christina. One of the first things I learned about Christina was her dedication to coordinating the December 6th vigil in memory of the women who lost their lives to an act of mass femicide at l'Ecole Polytechnique at the Université de Montréal in 1989. At each new organization Christina works with, she continues to organize these vigils, honoring the lives of these women and restating the commitment to ending gender-based violence in their memory. After working in the field of domestic violence for over a decade, Christina decided to expand her scope of practice into community-based trauma therapy and advocacy with survivors of sexualized violence. And not long after, I decided to follow her. There are some people in this world who you just know will do big things and make lasting and impactful systemic changes. Christina is one of these people, and I just couldn't pass up the chance to see and be a small part of what she would do next. In the short time that I've known Christina, she has advocated for the rights of those experiencing gender-based violence within our community, within our province, and is now advocating for changes within our governmental legislation, which has national and international implications. I've watched Christina stand in the streets of Halifax, in the rain, sleet and snow, advocating for safe and adequate housing, resources and supports for women and families fleeing domestic violence. I have seen her challenge our province to dig deeper into the root causes of the port of peak mass casualty, emphasizing the role gender-based violence plays in mass casualties, amplifying the voices of victims and survivors most marginalized in our communities, and highlighting gender-based violence as a public health emergency while she sat as an advisor on the Mass Casualty Commission. I'm now witnessing Christina advocate for changes to our legislation, putting forth Bill 144, which seeks to ban the misuse of non-disclosure agreements as a tool to silence victims and survivors of harassment, assault, discrimination, and other human rights violations. Time and again, I have witnessed those who benefit from the status quo attempt to silence Christina. And like many formidable feminists before her, she simply gets back up and comes back louder because Christina isn't speaking for herself, She's speaking on behalf of women, girls, and survivors of gender-based violence everywhere. As a social worker and advocate, 
a therapist, a colleague, a mentor, and a friend, Christina embodies everything I could hope to be as a social worker, possessing an exceptional ethical compass, compass, genuine regard and respect for the rights and dignity of others, and a passion for social justice through standing with and continuously amplifying the voices of those most marginalized and vulnerable in our society. Congratulations, Christina. Thank you everyone for listening. And I hope you are inspired to join the cause as Nova Scotia Justice Minister has recently announced that the Nova Scotian government will not be passing Bill 144 in the fall sitting. In honor of Diane Kayes, Christina, gender-based violence advocates and survivors everywhere, we should all be making some noise about that. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Christina Fifield, and I'm honored to be here tonight as the recipient for the Diane Kayes Memorial Reward. And I want to start by acknowledging Diane's contribution to the field of social work and gender-based violence work and her commitment throughout her career to justice doing work, listening, advocating, and working alongside of survivors. Diane, your legacy inspires me to continue to address the systemic injustices where far too many marginalized and vulnerable members of our community continue to be impacted by injustices, oppressions, and violence. The work that was done by Diane and so many other feminist leaders, advocates, and frontline staff, including many of my colleagues over the years in the gender-based violence sector, is the reason why I'm here tonight and why my commitments are very intentional in justice doing work while working in community along survivors impacted by violence. I learn from and inspired by survivors and my colleagues each and every day. In my current role as the Provincial Therapeutic Supervisor and a Trauma Therapist at Avalon, I've had some pretty amazing opportunities over the past few years in leading Avalon's participation in a coalition with LEAF National and Wellness Within for the Nova Scotia Public Inquiry of April 2020, mass casualty events in our province. I have been working alongside of other advocates in Nova Scotia and nationally as well around um, necessary legislative changes in the abuse of non-disclosure agreements and sexual violence, harassment, racism, discrimination, and other human rights violation cases. Through much advocacy work that I did through leading Avalon's participation in the public inquiry, I was able to co-author a report centered around work I completed with my colleagues and survivors to ensure the voices of marginalized survivors were not left out of the commission's work. Avalon's work was reflected in key recommendations that were reflected in the Turning the Tide Together final report of the Mass Casualty Commission. And as a result of this work, I have been appointed and hold a seat in the country for the gender-based actually the only seat in the country for the gender-based and violence, sorry, gender-based violence and advocacy sector as a member of the Progress and Monitoring Committee to monitor and ensure the Commission's recommendations are implemented both by the Government of Canada and the Government of Nova Scotia. I'm encouraging you all here tonight to make a commitment and find balance in your work to create intentional space, to be informed advocates, and to be in involved in justice doing work. Find an area in your social work practice that inspires you, challenges you, and lean into an aspect of justice doing work. Community work and justice doing work is where I continue to find balance to sustain myself in continuing to work in the field of gender-based violence. There is much work ahead for all of us as a professional, as social workers, in addressing the cultural shifts needed to address systemic injustices. And I'm encouraging you to get involved in the work ahead, build your solidarity teams, and don't be afraid to use your voice. We matter to this work and we need to continue to move this very important work forward. I think the Nova Scotia College of Social Work and the individuals that nominated me tonight, um, and I'm very honored uh, to receive this award. Thank you. The Social Justice Advocacy Committee created a special award 
uh, two years ago. And that award goes to an ally of social workers because social workers don't do the work alone. We do the work with other people. And we've been really intentional throughout our work together, especially our social justice committee at building allyship and building uh, partnerships with other organizations and with other individuals. So for example, our advocacy day event that we have done now two years in a row and mark your calendars for March 25th of next year as we have our third advocacy day where we're advocating with psychologists and doctors and social workers and chaplains and occupational therapists and most importantly, people with first voice experience and also very importantly with organizations that can amplify our voice so that we can be heard really loudly. And we have been getting heard more and more loudly the more we build these partnerships together. And the first year we had Anna Kwan, who is uh, someone who lives with mental health challenges and who is a writer and advocate and artist and just amazing. And um, we celebrated her. Second year we had uh, as our social justice ally award winner, we had Ryan um, from Member Two, who has created this amazing organization to empower Indigenous men in their recovery. And he shared a little bit of his story. And he also has spoken in our advocacy day work. This year, we have received several nominations for Dr. Zink. Dr. Zink, if you don't know her, is a truly inspirational powerhouse in our community and in our part of the world. She leads the work on gender affirming care. And she is a psychiatrist with Dalhousie and IWK. And she has been training providers all across um, Seated Mi'kma'ki and beyond in how do we begin to provide WPATH training, gender assessment? How do we work aligned with the global recommendations of providing the best standards of care for um, gender affirming care for people who are gender diverse? She also organizes once a month uh, superv supervision, uh, sort of like a interprofessional collaborative supervision where doctors of, of right, whether they're pediatricians, primary care, endocrinologists, or um, surgical uh, providers, or their psychiatrists, or their social workers, or their counselors, or their psychologists, we gather together and we discuss clinical issues that come up and arise. Um, and it's an opportunity for uh, peer supervision, group supervision. And it's so amazing that we have that she has drawn to this group people from Ontario, people from New Brunswick, because there's nothing else that's happening. And um, it's really powerful what she is doing in terms of really modeling the kind of vision that we are advocating for, the kind of vision that we want to see, not just in terms of gender affirming care, but in terms of every single intersectional issue that there are groups of providers that specialize in this, that move outside of the colonial silos that have us be like only psychologists talk to each other, only social workers, right? That instead we are sharing cross fertilizing information. And in fact, our advocacy project this summer on, Mar on uh, where we wrote to the Department of Community Services and the Minister of Health and the Minister of Education, and we reached out and are advocating for gender diverse kids all happened because Dr. Zink held this um, supervision group. And there was an endocrinologist who said, you know, I have a problem because I've noticed a lot of my kids that are coming to me for care are telling me that they can't go to the bathrooms in their schools. And I don't understand this, said the endocrinologist. And then another psychologist said, I've been seeing this problem too. And then another therapist said, yes, I have been seeing this problem too. And thus began, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? And because our social justice committee had already created, thanks to its partnership with the Legal Information Society of Nova Scotia, uh, allyship and a toolkit, I said, well, this is something that our social justice committee would like to do because our ethics committee had also begun to receive ethical concerns from social workers who were observing that the guidelines were not being either followed or were not clearly indicating how schools should be handling issues around bathroom access. And thus began the beginning of our advocacy work that is ongoing, that is there to protect the most marginalized and vulnerable amongst us, those kids who are not able to speak for themselves comfortably or who, when they are, are not listened to or heard, and our social workers, our members. But we really want to be celebrating this model of care that is broad and inclusive and diverse, that brings together expertise, because none of us knows everything. But together, 
we not only are more effective in our advocacy, but also in our practice, which is exactly what the communities of practice is also intended to do. How do we share resources together? How do we begin to learn and grow and evolve? And in fact, we are working with other um, mental health providers, psychologists, occupational therapists, um, spiritual care providers to see how can we all come together to, to sometimes share best practices with one another. Dr. Zink embodies all of those qualities, all of those dreams, and she has been doing that since before we even came up with this award. Therefore, it is with great honor and great gratitude that I get to share this award with you, Dr. Zink. Neither you or I are actually able to be here to celebrate it, but thanks to technology and uh, videos, we are able to communicate and you are able to feel our deep gratitude for everything that you do and for the amount of um, resistance that you encounter and the ways in which you continue to focus on what you're there to do, which is to keep children alive. Thank you for everything you do and know that you have the Nova Scotia College of Social Workers deep and enduring appreciation and that together we can help protect more children from harm and ensure that they are able to live until they're 18 and hopefully beyond and thrive. Thank you. Thank you for being an ally to our social justice committee. We are better and stronger thanks to you. It's my pleasure to thank uh, those at the Nova Scotia College of Social Workers my nominator and my colleagues at the Nova Scotia College of Social Workers for this award. Um, it was a great honor to hear about it. I learned about it in a meeting of our peer supervision group um, from Naj Saritsky and then later in an email from Suzanne Kutak and was quite stunned and pleased that uh, the work that we're all doing together has led to um, this. Uh, it's hard for me to explain how much this means to me because Nancy Wright, um, the late Nancy Wright, uh, was my co-founder on the team and uh, one of the things she used to say to me as uh, I would lament that I wasn't able to kind of answer the questions of everyone who had been reaching out to us or understand how I could possibly respond to this phone call. And in addition to our clinical work, she would look at me and shake her head and say, Sue, we, you need to put more social worker into that psychiatrist. And so I feel like in many ways, this is a way of uh, believing that I've finally been able to achieve that and <laughs> reach the goal that Nancy had for this team and, and the vision that we've created together as a team. Um, the hub of mental health care in Nova Scotia are the social workers um, and without them nothing would get done <laughs> in terms of day-to-day um, -day care uh, as well as the kind of lens that you bring to the work in mental health and so your valuable team members everywhere. I want to give a special thanks to those who have been longtime members of the Maritime Peer Supervision Group for Child and Youth Clinicians. Um, there's such a great richness to what you bring and you've held me up in a difficult time. These have been uh, difficult times to be a trans ally, to be involved in trans care, or to be trans or non-binary yourself or a parent. Um, and this is a great source of pride and hope and uh, more good things to come from uh, all of our collaborative work. So thank you very much for this honor. I'm so sorry I can't be with you tonight and uh, God bless. <laughs>